I want to pick up um, specifically on, on what you said about reverse engineering your story. Mm -hmm. Find the ending, mm -hmm. work out a way to get to that ending that the audience is going to be desperate to land on it, mm -hmm. but not expect to get there. Now, now, now you, your two most recent films, Darkest Hour and The Theory of Everything, are both based on true stories. Mm -hmm. Incredibly well-known men whose achievements, I think Churchill in particular, mm are not just widely known, but quite well understood by the general public. So how, when you're adapting a true story, can you still take the audience to a point in history that they're already aware exists and still make it feel unexpected? Well, if you take Darkest Hour as an example, I, I began Darkest Hour um, at about 10 years ago, and it was at a moment when I realized that three of the greatest speeches of all time were written and delivered by Winston Spencer Churchill, and, and within one four-week period. Now, it's extraordinary for, for any leader to create a speech that will, you know, rival a, a soliloquy from Shakespeare, but he wrote three absolute doozies in a four-week period. Um, and then I did a, did a little digging and did research and thought what compelled this, comp this outpouring of magnificent rhetoric, um, because it wasn't, it wasn't true of Churchill's whole career that he was churning out these great speeches. Um, and, and the facts were this, it, it was nothing less than the collapse of Central and Western Europe under the Nazi boot and enormous domestic pressure at home to do a peace deal with Adolf Hitler. Um, I didn't know about the, the peace deal with Adolf Hitler. I'm, it, it's kind of airbrushed out of history, and, and I think the person most wielding the airbrush is Winston himself. He, uh, I think he devoted like a paragraph to it in his huge history of Second World War. Um, so it was like, oh, there's news here. There's a different man than, than the one we're handed down from history. So, um, you know, that fitted in with all my little obsessions that pedestals are for statues and it's great to take heroes down and you know make them human but you have to have a, have justification for that and I just found him wonderfully complicated and and um, flawed and uncertain and and I thought okay now this is a this is a movie worth making because uncertainty to me rather than being a a negative is actually a prerequisite in Alita because Uncertainty allows for the possibility you may be wrong. And if we have leaders incapable of thinking that they may be wrong, we're all in deep shit, it seems to me. There's a wonderful line that Cromwell wrote to the Church of Scotland, um, uh, and uh, it, it goes like this. He said, I beseech thee in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be wrong. And I would love that to be written above the doorways of every world leader. Just allow for that possibility, and then you'll be open-minded. So that's, that's the kind of, that's where I start to know my ending. I know that I'm going to create a man who you, you establish them as, as one thing, and then you make them something else. You present them as something else. I saw the whole journey then. Given that you built the film around these three speeches, or that was mm. certainly the jumping off point for the screenplay, um, and the speeches are reasonably well known as, as, as political speeches go, they're very well known. Um, mm. Do you feel there's an obligation to, you know, give the audience Churchill plays the hits? I mean, was there a way in which you could bring a fresh take to these speeches um, when, when you sat down? Or did you think, okay, we're just going to let these play out? And there's, there's one moment I want to refer mm. back to specifically, but I'd, I'd just like to ask well, you in general first. There was no, in, in the House of Parliament, in the Commons, there was no recordings made of those speeches. So in fact, the, re the recordings we have of Fight Them on the Beaches and so forth was made um, after the war, I think 1946, and the BBC said we should get a recording of these because they were rather good. And so the, it, Winston says, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it for my bed. And there's a photograph of him sitting in a little fat pink in his onesie, you know, and he's and they've got a microphone dangling from the ceiling, and he did a very quiet rendering of these speeches. So the the, the copies we have are not, I don't. And Gary, this is Gary's observation too, that they they're a poor um, representation of what he would have delivered to 800 parliamentarians because he was a he was a showboater, he was an actor. So he really was on a stage. So when Joe Wright filmed the scene, and it's extraordinarily beautifully done when you see the film, 
We, um, Joe didn't put 50 p people in as extras. He brought in 800 extras, fully costumed. Gary came out there like Winston would have done, like an actor having to belt those lines to the back rows. Um, so that's a completely different um, take on those great speeches that audiences will never have seen. But, but we think it's probably the most um, accurate. 